you really think about it, you know, people, they run in that rat race of life, um, looking at being wealthy and not thinking that really their health is their wealth. And that's what's really important is to have that balanced lifestyle. So today you have uh, Chef Dario and yes. Anita with um, Anita and Dario's Adventures, where we inspire you to all live your life. And we are the branch, the olive branch to the Mediterranean lifestyle for you. We talk about health. We talk about food, we talk about cooking, um, all kinds of things to inspire you. And today we have an incredible guest. His name is Dr. Richard Harris, and he is a medicine lifestyle specialist. He's a doctor, and uh, it was interesting because we actually were on a podcast for him, and his, his podcast is called Strive for Health, Great Health Podcast. So if you get a chance to go and listen to him, um, it's, it's really, really wonderful. So we're just going to let uh, Dr. Harrison, just one minute, I just wanted to talk about one thing was the, uh, the challenge that we have coming up. It's a half, half, uh, health and happiness challenge that's going to be coming up on the uh, 15th to the 19th. So excited to see you there. And um, yeah, you know, come on over to, we're going to put the link in the, in below in the Facebook uh, comments for you to come and join. Uh, and we're going to be talking about a lot of things over the five days, one hour a day, um, maybe we'll have Dr. Uh, Dr. Harris come on then too for the health and happiness challenge as well. Because, uh, you know, with the podcast that we did with him, we really, really enjoyed spending time with uh, Dr. Harris and everything that he believes in. Well, I think I think it's important that we actually compound everything that has to do with, uh, you know, health and happiness. You know, it's food, it's lifestyle, it's and everything. And what better to have a person who really knows and has study and has researched it to really explain how it's done. Yeah. So we're going to bring on Dr. Harris here now. There he is. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Hello, Anita and Dario. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. Um, I, we're having a hard time hearing you, actually. Is there a way to be able to... Um... Is that better? Oh, oh, there we go. Much better. All right. So uh, we introduced you. We're so happy to have you on um, our interview because, of course, we were on your podcast and we really enjoyed it. And I guess what really connected us was the cook together segment part of, of what we do with our Olivia Life and the Mediterranean lifestyle. And uh, that really tweaked, it, tweaked a, a sense of common, common uh, ground between all of us, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's because that's how I grew up. You know, I always like to start these things first by thanking my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by allowing me to come and speak with everyone today. And second, that I grew up in the kitchen. Uh, my grandmother was a chef. We didn't know she was a chef until after she passed. We found a, a certificate for cooking college, um, culinary school. And she brought us up in the kitchen. I remember being at their house and going to pick uh, plums and apples and grapes from the the stuff and you know the fruits in their backyard and we'd make homemade ice cream and we were always cooking together and I think that was something that I didn't really appreciate until I got older how beautiful those moments were as a family being able to spend that time together and learn so many different skills uh, I remember learning so much from the adults in the room, just listening to their conversations. And, you know, these are things you don't think about as a kid, but looking back, you realize how valuable those moments were. And for my family, I can't wait to create those valuable moments when me and my wife do have kids. Mm -hmm. And I know that in the podcast, you mentioned that you and your wife, you cook a lot together as well, right? We do. We do. It's one of the things I look forward to the most every single day is, we alternate cooking, you know, she'll cook, I cook, she says I'm the better cook. So she, she prefers me to do most take of the that, cooking. Take that compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. She's a good cook. She doesn't give herself enough credit. She just hasn't been doing it as long as, as I have, but it, it's a time for us to connect. It's a time for us to talk about our day. It's a time for us to strategize on our visions and where we want to go as a, as a couple. And we really use that time as our time to disconnect from the rest of the world. You know, we're not on our cell phones. We're not watching TV. We're just doing something together, building a healthy life for each other. And those moments are precious and beautiful. 
Yeah. You, you speak our language. <laughs> I love it. And that's what I think, you know, a lot of people nowadays, it's, it's the, you know, the beginning of the podcast, we were talking about your health is your wealth. And people are struggling so much to get everything faster and to do everything quicker. And they're forgetting to slow down and just enjoy those moments. And those moments, those precious moments, and for two reasons, I always think one is you're cooking healthy food, right? The meals that you're making are healthy. You know, what's in it, you know, the ingredients. And number two is the connection part of it. That's so important. So people sometimes they think, Oh, I just want to have that quick. It goes back to the fifties with those TV dinners, you know, that you really didn't know what was in them. You put them in quickly and, uh, and sit in front of the TV and watch them. And it just really isn't very good for your health, right? No, it's not. And actually, there's a lot of data on the benefits of cooking together. Number one, like we talked about, it strengthens bonds between yeah. family, between kids, between spouses. It encourages curiosity because a lot of times when you're cooking, you use different spices from all over the world. And so, you know, we've seen a lot of racial insensitivity lately. And I think that cooking together could be a way to bridge that because you're taking in other cultures and being more acceptive of different ways of doing things. And, you know, we've both traveled the world and food is a big portion of a lot of other cultures. There's a lot of pride in what goes into a meal. And I think part of that transfer is when you begin to cook together and see these and try these other meals from other parts of the world, there's data that it brings positive memories, just like we just talked about, that you look back at these memories of cooking together and being together and sharing a meal together. And that brings happiness, which is very well needed in this day and age where anxiety, depression, fear are at all time rates. There's data that it helps us focus on the simple things that we can tune out all that background noise. And there's data that with kids, it helps them build life skills, they actually perform better in school when you cook together. So there's a lot of really good benefits, both for mental health, physical health, and spiritual health that you have by doing just something that is so simple as being in the kitchen together, making a meal together. Yeah. And it's interesting. You, you talk about connecting people outside of just the household too, because we do a lot of, uh, um, we call it cook a vision we do for corporate and companies are so disconnected right now. And you're talking about, you know, different races, you're talking about different departments, you're talking about different levels of education um, within a corporation that there, there is, there's judgment in there, there's um, not that connected, everyone's so siloed, and don't know how to take that next step. And whenever we do these classes, especially I find even when we do um, in the, the tech world, because with them, they're in front of the computer, they're it's even more of an experience for them where they open up and we get them together to do a power bowl. And like you said, it just brings people together in, those, in all those circumstances in families and corporations in any type of cooking class that be available out there. Yeah, absolutely. I've done a couple of cooking classes at like Sir La Table and, and that type of thing. And the last one we did, we were in Dallas visiting one of my really close friends and his wife and his wife and my wife have become really good friends now. And we did a cooking class together. And yeah. it was awesome. It was so much fun. Yeah. You know, we brought our wine and we're learning how to cook a, a new dish. And, you know, we're interacting with other couples there and learning their background and their stories. And there are people there from all over the world, all over yeah. the country. And yeah. it was amazing just to get to connect and, and experience that with them. And it took like two, three hours out of our, our day, right? Not a, a humongous amount of time, but it was well worth it for the experience and the connection that it was able to bring. And it's a reward, reward as well, because you get a great uh, great plate of food. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, it was amazing. It was good food. Uh, yeah. So, you know, what made you decide to get into to medicine and become a doctor? Was there something that triggered that? Yeah, if I had to look back, I would say it was after I read Ben Carson's book, Gifted Hands. Okay. And it talked about how he was one of the first to perform a surgery to um, separate conjoined twins in the head, something wow. that, you know, was very, very dangerous. And when I read that, I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I think that moment was when the seed was planted to become a doctor. I wanted to be a surgeon, but I have a benign tremor. So I can't be a surgeon, but I decided that I, I liked 
internal medicine because I always viewed everything in the body as connected. And I didn't like how certain specialties would only focus on the heart or the liver or the lungs. And you may do one thing that helps the lungs, but it hurts the rest of the body. And that doesn't make sense to me. And I, I really wanted to be that holistic head to toe kind of physician that looks at everything in the body as integrated, but not just look at what's inside the body, look at what's outside the body, because our environment, and that's social, that's economic, that's physical matters just as much as what's going on inside the body. Yeah, and it also affects what's inside the body too, right? The stress that's out there nowadays. And so, you know, you call yourself a, it's a supports lifestyle medicine, a doctor for lifestyle medicine. So how would you explain that to somebody? What, what, uh, how would you explain that? Yeah, I think, well, not that I think the data shows that lifestyle medicine is the most important aspect of medicine. And what lifestyle medicine is, is that everything we do on a daily basis can either add to our health or subtract from our health. And what I like to tell people is what I do is make sure you're putting deposits into your literal health savings account, which is your body. And those deposits are both physical, they're mental, and they're spiritual. And so lifestyle medicine is the, the cornerstone of the where those three things interact. And we do things like nutrition, we do exercise, we do stress management, so mindfulness, sleep. And then we focus on the environment as well. Is your environment toxic, physically toxic, like the household products you use, the air in the environment, the drinking water, are you using plastic water bottles, all that kind of stuff to is it socially toxic? What are your friends? Yeah. What are they talking about? How are you interacting with them? You know, if all your friends are depressed and anxious and just spouting fear and fear mongering all the time, you need new friends. Yeah. You need people who are positive who are speaking life into you who are exuding where you want to be in life mm -hmm. and so that's everything that goes into into lifestyle medicine and it is sorely needed because what most people don't realize now is that most of the diseases we face are lifestyle diseases yeah. and most of them are preventable and a lot of it can be reversible 90 percent of heart disease in america is preventable 90% of diabetes type two is preventable. 90% of obesity is preventable. Half, probably more than half of the cancers that we see are preventable. Alzheimer's are about the same, all right? And these are six of the seven top causes of early death here in the US. And a lot of that is preventable. And lifestyle is the most important aspect of that. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it, isn't it interesting because, you know, you, 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 you know, you talk about, you know, your body be, in creating the a savings account in your body, you know, and the importance of really focusing on what is really important to you. And, you know, if we go back to our ancestors, you know, they live much longer because they simplified their life and because they focused on their nutrition because there was not an abundance of things available to them. It's because I think we have so much stuff available to us so much so much things are available to then we just overtake and we minimize our life isn't it interesting that now we have an abundance of everything and we're taking more time away from our life that's that's what i think is the phenomenon that is happening right now yeah there's a lot of us who say that disease is caused by a mismatch between our genes and our lifestyle and that if you go back to a lot of people just call it the ancestral lifestyle, the things that we used to do that were beneficial for our health and modernity, you know, modern life has caused a lot of disease and illness. And it's really important what you just mentioned, purpose, right? Having a sense of a calling or a duty in life. There's data that supports this. If you're optimistic, you live 12% longer, some studies say up to 15% longer, and have a 35% reduction in cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes. That's a monstrous number just by thinking positive thoughts. There's data on purpose that a sense of purpose is one of the strongest things for our well being. In fact, if you look at when people retire, mortality rates, death rates spike. And it's right. out of proportion to what you'd expect for age or comorbidities or anything. The reason is because most people retire without a plan and they go from having purpose 
to sitting on the couch watching daytime TV all day, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful way to make yourself sick and miserable. And so that's why there's all these studies where people who work longer live longer. And that's because they keep that sense of purpose longer. And I always tell people, look, you got to have a plan for every phase of your life. Yeah. You got to have a plan for when you retire. You can't just sit on the couch all day. I saw this with my parents. They were miserable for yeah. years after retirement, just completely miserable. And we finally talked them into doing some charity work, sitting on boards, you know, giving back to the community. And, and now they're in a much happier place. But I think that's something that was lost. And if you look at other cultures, you know, like the in the Mediterranean, like in the Middle East, like in Asia, we fear getting old here. But in a lot of other cultures, it's revered to age. It's respected to age. It's a sign of of wisdom, a sign of strength. And we do a really bad job of looking at it like that here. And I think that's something that, that's very important as we transition through the phases of our life is to always have that purpose. And as we enter our elder years, go back to what we used to do, which was give back and give knowledge and help the next generation and, and steer them and, and be a, a source of wisdom and a, a, a power, a, a pillar to the community. Yeah. Well, that's what I think with, with Dario, because he teaches the, um, the program at um, one of the colleges here for chefs to get their master's in Italian cuisine. And I always say, what a great feeling, you know, that you're teaching future chefs um, to be able to, to, to expand that craft. And now I think with sometimes with, with chefs, they don't realize how much hard work it really is. It's glamorized that, oh, you're going to be a chef and it's just an Instagram, but to work in a kitchen is a lot of hard work. And I think it's really important. And we always say, we're never going to retire. <laughs> but we think... love what we do. We love reaching people and giving our experience um, from what we do. So it's such a true thing. And one of the, actually one of the principles of our Mediterranean lifestyle, the purpose, which is really important. I think we're taking everything also for granted. And, you know, when I see it most of the time when, you know, we, you know the reasoning or going back and, and, and spending time with the younger generation or sharing your message to other people is from experience, you know, experience then you lived and experience, you know, have you, then you've seen from, for example, your parents or whomever, then you, uh, then you wanted to learn. You need to understand that you want to become a sponge and you want to give back, you know, and I think if everybody's taking that point in time to really sharing and supporting the system, you know, it's funny because you mentioned about the Mediterranean. Well, you know, in the Mediterranean, you know, you live life because there is purpose, okay? And, and purpose is, is what really drives you, you know, to, to just live, you know? And sometimes when we live in North America, we just, you know, we, we, we are stressing about the future. We are stressing what's going to be when we stop. We fall really engaging and enjoying and cherish it, you know, those building blocks we are making. It's almost like you, you know, you're spending all your time building this house, and then when you get in, you're bored, you want another one, you know, and, and, and that's something that, you know, we encourage based on what we do uh, with, the, with the generational people and some of our, our clients to really embark on this beautiful journey that we have, and really starting with your brain first. Allow your brain to connect with your body, with the people you surround yourself. You made a really good point. Uh, you know, what is the worst thing to really surround yourself with people that have a negative mindset that really don't follow maybe, you know, they're, they're great friends, but maybe they're really good acquaintance. It's not necessarily the people you want to hang around with all the time. Yeah, the, the, some of the five people you hang around, they say, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's kind of funny because I've always said that the number one thing I've been blessed with was my friends. I've been blessed all my life with a rock solid friend group who support each other, nourish each other, we're tough on each other, we call each other on our BS all the time. And you know, we can be we can be harsh on each other because we expect a lot out of each other. And I was looking through my phone at a entrepreneurial brunch and I was looking at all the people I had messaged. And I said, whoa, like 20 of the last 25 people I messaged are all entrepreneurs. And none of them started off that way. It was just that we all gravitated towards that lifestyle as, as we got older 
because we've been so aligned from the get-go. So as we all transition through different phases of our lives, we all transition together. And I think that's been really beautiful because now we share books with each other, we share tips, we share uh, information, and it, it's been really helpful having that circle around me that's grown as I've grown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. So we had a couple questions that um, came up. Um, one of them was, what is it that you like to eat as a doctor? What is it that's your favorite meals or um, what would you like to think of as your top choices for people to go to for healthy uh, eating? Yeah, absolutely. So I tell people there's two things that if you do these two things with nutrition, you get most of it right. Right, because nutrition can be as complex or as simple as you want it to be. Right. Um, and I, I try to make it simple for people. So I have two basic rules. Number one, I'm a big 80-20 person, right? Because no one's going to eat perfect all the time. You're setting yourself up for failure with that. And you're creating a really bad association with food if you get down on yourself because you eat a brownie. One brownie's never killed anybody unless it's been <laughs> laced with poison, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one brownie's not going to kill you. It's not going to derail you. It, it, it's not horrible for you, right? So my, my two rules are, number one, get 80% of your food, your calories from single ingredient foods, stuff that you don't need a label from. You know, you don't need a label to know what broccoli is or cauliflower or asparagus or, or blueberries or fish or chicken or turkey. You look at it and you're like, I know what this is. All right. The second thing is the composition of our plates. Most of the time, people eat way too much meat and way too many carbohydrates and not enough vegetables, not enough fruits. So 50% of my plate is vegetables. 25% is meat plus eggs plus nuts, you know, kind of the protein sources. And then the last 25% is fruit plus starch. And that's kind of my home base. Like if you imagine a color coded plate, like when we were kids, right, that's sectioned off. That's what I imagine before every single meal. And I just fill in the sections with things that I have around the house. So breakfast might be uh, greens, you know, spinach or something like that with some eggs, some nuts, and then some fruit that fit, that fits all four, all three quadrants. And then my dinner, cause I only eat twice a day would be some type of meat, fish, chicken, turkey, beef, whatever I eat all with uh, vegetables cauliflower, you know, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, something like that. And then I would have maybe a little bit of starch, which is usually long grain rice, or potatoes, or quinoa, something like that. And that's my dinner. And that's the the way that I eat for health just to make sure that I'm covering all my bases. Yeah, so I, I imagine this plate and so you would cook like a quinoa and put it sort of in that area, or do you actually make a dish? Like there's, there's a favorite meal that you would do that would sort of encompass a lot of that stuff. Do you do like a casserole or something, or do you just do like stir fries or what, what is sort of your go-to meals? Yeah. So most of the time it's just that I just combine stuff together because, you know, we're busy. Right. And so a lot of the times I just want to eat to fuel my body. And that's what I do. I'll just grab something from one of those buckets and then put it on the plate. But then when we sit down, and usually this is a weekend where we have more time, uh, the wife usually will pick a recipe and say, I want to try this this weekend. I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll do that this weekend. And so we leave those times when we're trying new recipes or doing a, a little bit more complicated dish to a time where we have more time. But during the week, we usually just keep it simple. Mm -hmm. and, and you know it's funny you say that because and, I, and i'm happy you're doing that because of course it, you know part of our our way of thinking about eating is very much what you say you know you have to have a good balance but you know you have to train your bodies like when you go to the gym you go into a workout you know you know you, you, can you have a brownie yeah you can have a brownie you gotta, but you gotta find a way to work out that brownie or to exercise that brownie out of your system, you know? We always say that in the Mediterranean lifestyle, the way we call it, it's not a diet, you know? And I, and I always emphasize the fact on people to say to people, there is no such a thing of having a diet or forcing yourself to have a diet. 
it's important for you to really work into the system, have the proper balance of protein, of uh, vegetable, or, or carbohydrate in a very small amount, and really research where they're coming from. That's the other thing that I talk about. You know, don't just grab things because you want to grab them, you know, and exercise those, you know, like you said, those five days a week, okay, then you are home to really eat it healthy, build a system, then your body, you know, is used to it. So now you're creating this workout every day. So your body now is used to it, right? I need to always say it takes 21 days to create a habit. Well, you know, start today, you got 20 more days to go. So then your body is going to get used to it. And then when you come on that weekend, like you said, then you become creative and you're building a little bit of a repertoire, but you know, you, you, you really investigate on this very important ingredients and talking about food in general, food, it, it's, it's nutrients, food is something that really keep your body all together. That's, that's what food is all about. You know, we, we take everything for granted. And I think to the, and I want to speak to the younger generation, you know, because we need to invest in grassroots. Let's be honest, you know, because, you know, like you said, you know, sometimes you just shove something to kids just to make them quiet or to just, you know, it's a faster way to do it before really thinking the damage actually we are doing. So focusing on grassroots really helps out on, on the system. So I'm glad you, 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 you think it like that. And I wish more people actually would think it like that. Then we would have less problem with obesity. And, and you're right, you know, for example, ment mental, mental health, that's a big problem. And people refer to mental health just on society. Well, yes, that is one thing. But your nutrition is a big factor. It's a big factor. We're talking about the fluid or the fuel you put into your engine. If it's not good fluid, that's what you're going to have a problem with. Yeah, and you brought up some really good points here. The first of which is I've never had a diet. I never use the word diet. I hate the term diet because it's restrictive. It, 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 it comes from a language of failure automatically when you say Thank I have you. a diet. Yes. I have a nutrition plan. I have a system. I have a system for eating that fuels my body to achieve the goals that I want to achieve. That's right. And that's how I have it. It's just like you said, with exercise, it's a routine. And once you get it down, you know, what I tell my clients is they always ask me for meal plans. I'm like, I don't do meal plans. I give you a sandbox. Here's the sandbox. You pick what you like out of the sandbox. You start to put together things yourself. Because if I give you a meal plan, you'll follow it for a week, two weeks, and then you'll stop because you invested nothing in the creation of that. So right. you have to create your own plan. You know, this is life. There's no handouts, yeah. right? It's, it's not that easy. And another point that you brought up is, is children. And this is something that's very important. Right. So there's a field called epigenetics and epigenetics is a study of gene expression, right? Our genetic code is set at birth. Now that does change over time as we age and causes damage and stuff like that. But the most important part of that is how those genes are expressed, right? right? I can't change a light switch, but I can turn it off and on. Right? Absolutely. That light switch is stuck to the wall, right? But I can flip it on and off. And so that's what gene expression is. And, and what is happening and why disease is accelerating at a rapid pace is because the decisions I make about my body before I have kids impacts my kids future. Yes. And in rat studies, this goes to seven generations. Wow. That's astronomical. And yeah, some people think that nice. may be the same for humans as well. And so this is not just about us. It's about what we're doing for the future. And if you ask anybody, yeah, I care about my kids. Yeah, I want my kids to be healthy. Okay, then what are you doing to ensure your kids health right now? Because it starts before you have them. And this is something that needs to be shouted from the mountaintops. This is why we see more um, autism these days. This is why we see more childhood obesity. This is why we see more childhood diabetes. You know, kids as young as four are being diagnosed with diabetes. There's no way that's that kid's fault. Wow. Zero percent chance that that kid's fault, right? That started, that process started somewhere in that parent's 20s yeah. with their health. And then it got passed on to that kid who was born, now their genes are telling them my environment is not safe. 
and they're viewing normal things as abnormal things and their body's reacting to try to protect it, but it's harming it. And so this is a very important conversation because it doesn't just impact us, it impacts our future generations and we're failing them because we're not leaving the world a better place. We're leaving more disease, more destruction, more death. And that's not a future that, that these kids, the future generations deserve to have. Yeah. I also find that with allergies, allergies is huge amongst kids these days too. And I've always asked people in the medical profession and, and say, why is that? And I never really had a good answer. Do you have one on allergies? Is it the yeah, same it's thing? A- it's the same thing because yeah. allergies are your immune system overreacting. I use my example for this. So I have horrible allergies and my mom was a smoker and she stopped smoking a couple months. She says a year, but I don't believe her. Uh, she stopped smoking like a couple months before she had me. And so that wasn't enough time for her epigenetics to change over. So when I was born, I had asthma and I had horrible allergies because of the signals that she passed on because of her habits told my genes that my environment was not safe from a toxin perspective. Mm -hmm. So my body started overreacting to things that were normal. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember this, but I was in and out of the hospital as a kid. I was a super sickly kid because of asthma. And then my sister was born a year and a half later. Now my mom didn't start smoking again. She doesn't have allergies. She doesn't have asthma because it was enough time for those epigenetic changes to happen to now she she got signals that hey this environment is not toxic there's there's not a whole lot of allergens or things like that you don't have to worry about that and so that's a a a personal example but it's a powerful story of the power of epigenetics and this is one of the reasons why you're seeing so many allergies because there's so many toxins in our environment and that signal is getting passed on that the environment is toxic. And so these, these kids' immune systems are overreacting mm-hmm. more easily. Wow, Dr. Iris, this is, this is actually a very, very, very sensitive subject, which is so powerful and so important for, for the world to really be aware because we are the foundation of what's to become, right? And you really think about, you know, why are we you made a really good point it just you know it's it's easy to 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 blame the child of you know while he's not eating well or he's eating well we, we create our environment we are the soil okay that creates that fruit to grow or that vegetable to grow and it's such an important impact and 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 this is why you know when we when when we start our our, our movement we call it it's about it's about really understanding the importance of your body and your mind okay because at the end of the day correct me if i'm wrong there are two things you really gotta focus your mind that allows your body to react okay and once you think about those two things properly okay and for myself as a chef i always think about um, the importance of the right nutrients the the importance to investigate on the ingredients the other thing you talked about the simplicity of the dish, you know, we always believe we need to complicate it. We need to put more stuff on our plate to make it look good. Well, no, actually, it's that way around because you actually put your body in shock. You're confusing your system. You know, a broccoli is a broccoli because it needs to be a broccoli. Okay. If you ever, if you ever cooking a broccoli, what are you going to do? Well, you're taking all the chlorophyll away. You're taking all the vitamin away. You're taking all the nutrients away. So that's not a broccoli anymore. That becomes now something. Okay. So is how, we talk about how to utilize those ingredients, how to simplify them. You know, a steamed broccoli is more worth it than anything else. Okay, even on a raw version. And I think is if us as a society and us, I'm talking about ourselves, the way we share to people with your help uh, as a medical specialist to um, make people maybe, I, I hate using the word understand, but think about it. You know, think about the impact you can give to the future. Because you're right, you know, we are the seed for the future. You know, uh, when we come, I always joke around to people. I said, you know, think about one thing. When you buy a computer or you buy anything, they come with a manual, you know, how to figure out. Your kids don't come with a manual. You are the manual. 
you're creating that manual. You're building the manual as it goes. So if you put the right foundation on that manual from the beginning, hopefully you're gonna have the right product. So it's, it's such an important um, thing you just said because we really don't realize the effect of the future or the imprint we are living now for the future. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very. So, Dr. Harris, we had a question that came in from the live. They're asking, uh, why do you only eat two twice a day? Yeah, I am a big believer in time restricted eating, you know, intermittent fasting, shorting your shortening your feeding window. There's actually some really good data that shows that we should marry our eating window to our circadian rhythm, meaning mm -hmm. eat when the sun is up, don't eat when the sun is not up because our metabolism is highest when the sun is up. Yeah. And that makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, right? You, you know, our ancestors didn't have the capabilities to eat in the dark. They, they just didn't, you know, uh, it, and it was lights. Edison wasn't around at that point. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, making a fire at night and having that there is it's dangerous, because you're, you're signaling your presence, you're signaling your location, right? And then if you start cooking meat at night or food at night, well, what's going to come? Predators. They're going to come and eat that because they're more active at night. So we didn't eat at night. And so our bodies are way more adapted to eat when the sunlight is up. And so that's why. That's one of the reasons. Um, number two is I had to listen to my body. I felt terrible for years eating breakfast and never understood why I would get so sleepy in the middle of the day. And then one day I just skipped breakfast and I had energy all throughout the day. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm on to something here. So I just started doing that where I would eat at noon and then I eat again at like six. And for me, that does, it does very, very well for my system. I feel energized all day. I don't feel hungry. I'm able to get all the calories and nutrients eating two meals a day. My first meal is big. My second meal is, is usually smaller. And I might snack in between that if I feel a little bit hungry. Some days I only eat once because if I'm not hungry, I'm not going to eat. And I just listen to, to my body and the signals that my body is telling me. And some days I might eat three times. If my body's telling me, hey, I need more nutrients, I'll listen. But shortening your feeding window allows you to really listen to your body and to differentiate hunger from boredom. Because one of the number one things fasting taught me is it's taught me what it feels like to be hungry. And then what I know, if, if it's not that same feeling, then what I'm experiencing is boredom. And I'll go take a walk or play with my dog or something like that, right? Yeah, that's so interesting. It's, it's funny because we did a video just the other day and I says, I came out with your body just knows when to pee. And it's true, right? It, you just go to the bathroom when you have to go to the bathroom. But people have forgotten to listen to their body when they need to rest, when they need to eat, you know, and they just, I, I have that when I need to write. So I do a lot of, um, a lot of writing. And, and when I get in that creative mode, I have to eat, I have to pick at something. And it's, it's one of those habits that's difficult for me. So I've actually gotten sunflower seeds and I have them in the shell and I'll sort of nibble on those because I know it's something that's that's been yeah. created. And I feel okay, if I've got to do this, I got to do it in a healthy way, then get up and, and go for something that that wouldn't be good. And then we eat, you know, normally we don't eat early in the morning or late at night anyway. That's kind of our our process too. But it's interesting the research on that because it is flip-floppy. There's some people that say, you know, you mm -hmm. should have three meals a day, that you shouldn't have, you know, five hours in between something in your stomach. And then there's other research the other way. So it's kind of uh, interesting. Yeah, it's it's and it's also I think it's it's your sleeping habit. Like for example, I don't require a lot of sleep because my body sometimes just turns on, and there are days when I require sleep. So and people say, "Well, you shouldn't. You should not. Well, you should. You're right. You should listen just to your listen to your body. Your body's gonna tell you." Yeah, absolutely. And there are people like that. You know, the the seven to nine hours is the recommendation. I've known people who could function completely fine on four hours of sleep. And we did extensive lab testing on them and all their systems were functioning normally, their hormones were functioning normally. And what I always tell people in the situation is if they say, Oh, I don't need, I don't need sleep. I'm like, well, how do you know? That's right. right? It's, it's like when people say, uh, I'm healthy. Well, how do you know? 
And, you know, one of the things I just did a podcast on was this was how do you check to actually see that you are healthy or not? Because you can't just say I'm healthy. You know, I was sitting next to a guy on a plane who was obese and diabetes. He's like, Oh, besides obesity and diabetes, I'm healthy. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the kind of bizarro world that, that we're living in right now. So it's important to put these things to the test. And there's tons of ways you can do it. Aura ring, Fitbit, Apple Watch, you know, some routine blood work, make checking your inflammation levels, your, your markers of metabolism. Right. These types of things are available to see. And then you can tweak your routine based upon what it shows. And just like you said, Dario, like I have an aura ring, I track. And, you know, sometimes it'll say that, you know, my sleep is off, my heart rate's off. You should take it easy today. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna take it easy today. And other days I'm like, man, I feel great. Check my data scores are through the roof and I'll go train really hard that day. And so I, I use these things to kind of tweak my routine. And it's just another way for me to be more in tune with my body. Yeah. We, we have that too. We both have the, the Garmin that we have the identical one so that we can, <laughs> you know, we did so many steps today. We did that. You know, we, we really love to get out daily and, and do oh, our yeah. walks, get That's... on the bikes. You know, we'll even go to the grocery store with a backpack and uh bring the groceries yeah. back in the winter like you know all the time just to kind of combine that exercise not just going to the gym which we do as well but um but it's interesting you sit you see that I, i'm gonna tell you something that just occurred to us uh well something occurred to me actually two days ago so two days ago i was in a city for, for business and i choose to stay downtown and and i had a really really long long day so i was up four o'clock in the morning and I was going all the way until probably five, six o'clock at night. And I was meeting my son, my older son. And he says, oh, that, you know, they live downtown. You want to go for a workout? My body was not fit to, for a workout that day, but I like to, I like to get to the workout as much as possible. And I said, well, you know what, let's, let me get there and I see what I feel. And right away, as I'm walking there, my brain was telling me, you're not fit to do that. I had a bit of a headache. It was a long day. And what I needed, it was time to reboot my system. Reboot my system. So I, I got to his place. I calmed down. I calmed down my system completely. We just had a cup of tea. And then I said, you know what, I'm ready for it. And I had an intense workout with very little sleep. And, and my son looks at me and, you know, it's 26, I'm 55. And he says, dad, what is this coming from? What, what, how do you have all this energy? I can't keep up. And, and the thing was, because I allow my body to adjust, and your body is really, you're right, it's telling you when to adjust, you know, calm down for a second, reboot, and then you're ready to go again. But if you say, ah, oh, it's okay, I'm just too tired, I just want to, well, then you create those habits again and you fall into the trap. It's easy to turn the TV on and watch something or, or break your mind off completely. So it's interesting you say that because that happened to me exactly uh, two days ago and I, I, I felt like incredible. Mm. Well, you know what? We're running low on time, unfortunately, because this is normally for only for half an hour. So can we can we have you back another day? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be delighted. Because we really want to talk about, you know, the eight principles around the Mediterranean lifestyle. And I know that we've, we've spoke about a brief a few of them um, and, and get some more advice from you because there's so much to learn. I mean, I could be on here for another five hours just learning more from you right. <laughs> with all this stuff that and the knowledge that you have. So um, I just wanted to leave people with two things. I wanted to ask you the question, you know, what are the two tips that you could give people uh, for health and happiness in their life? Maybe one health, one, one happiness sort of tip that would cover it and right. um, some advice from, from you that you could give. Yeah, I think that whenever I talk to people about this, I try to get people to buy into the healthy lifestyle with two things. The first is mindfulness. And that could be a gratitude practice, that could be meditation, it could be yoga, it could be Tai Chi, it could be prayer, it could be an intentional walk, you know, any of those things. And there's so much data on the benefits of mindfulness it makes you smarter, it decreases inflammation in the body, it improves rest, it improves the balance in your nervous system, it actually can cut 
there's one study that shows it cut pain levels by half and pain unpleasantness by half. No medication could get even close to that, right? Because it helps rebalance your nervous system. And there's data shows it increases happiness and, and self-esteem. So that it's some super simple. I tell people an hour a week, you have 168 hours a week, spend an hour of it doing some mindfulness. It doesn't have to be consecutive. It can be spread, you know, two minutes here, three minutes here, whatever. And the second part is if you can try fasting, try shortening your feeding window. Mm. And this is something that can be very, very powerful for a lot of people. And there's data showing it improves cholesterol and blood sugars. It improves cognition, um, memory scores. It helps with body weight as well. I mean, there's tons of benefits. And I think one of the main benefits it helps with is willpower because you're conditioned to eat all throughout the day. If you, if you watch any type of TV, what do you see the most? Food commercials. They're all over the place, right? So food commercials in the food industry is big money. And so it, you've been conditioned through marketing to eat all the time. You just try and shortening your feeding window, even if it's by an hour or two, just try it and see how you feel and then go from there. And I, I bet you, you'll feel a lot better shortening your feeding window. Oh, that's great. I yeah. love that advice. Now, if you were to say, what is it, 12 hour um, fasting, would that be something that you'd recommend if someone was asked for specific times? Yeah, that's probably the safest thing to do is yeah. a 12 12. And again, if you can marry that to when the sun is up, and so maybe if you live in a certain place during the winter, you may have to shorten that a little bit, right? But um, the, the, that the 1212 is probably the easiest place and the place that even people with medical conditions or diabetes or things like that can do. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Because some people, you know, they take this advice and they go to the extreme, right? And they'll maybe they'll, they'll eat at 12 and then at one or something <laughs> in the right. day. So it's always good to give some kind of parameters. And the, the biggest thing is listening to your body as well, right? Correct. Yeah. You don't, don't be dogmatic about this. Yeah. If you feel like your blood sugar is dropping or if you feel hungry, eat. Like I do that. I do 16-8 fasting, but if I feel something's off, I'll eat. Yeah. Right. Or like today, you know, I did this and then I have to drive an hour and a half to do another speaking event. So I ate this morning because yeah. I know if I didn't eat, I'm not going to get back to the house till 5 p.m. Yeah. So, you know, and it, it takes a lot of cognitive ability to be able to do these types of presentations and, and speak. Your brain needs to be really functional. And yeah. so I ate earlier today to give myself the energy and the fuel to deliver as much value to the people who are coming to see me. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's really important. And, and you had a workout today too, so you felt that was also giving you a little bit of energy, right? To, to do your oh, workout. Oh yeah, yeah. I have to. I mean, that's that's like my day only starts after I finish a workout. Yeah. Uh, it's um, it's so important. You're right. It's such of a it's such of a, a a mind booster and a physical booster just to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And like I said, there's so many other things that we want to talk about. It's always lovely chatting with you. So hopefully we can get you on for another Thursday. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anytime you guys just let me know. I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate everything you guys do. Okay. Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ariston. Thank you for all the information. Thanks for. You're welcome. Okay. Have Bye a great day. Bye-bye.